connected to. I'm going to go through a few um, announcements and introductions, and then I will hand over the floor to our speaker, Anne. So if you have never been before, we have a Facebook group that you can connect between meetups. If you go on Facebook and you just search WordPress accessibility, it will come up. Otherwise, it's facebook.com slash groups slash WordPress dot accessibility is the direct URL. It's a good place to share what you're working on, get feedback, ask questions, answer other people's questions. Um, and so we're trying to build a community around WordPress accessibility, and it's been it's been really great watching that grow. Uh, everyone always asks, is this being recorded? Yes, it is being recorded. Uh, the recordings for all of our past meetups are available on equalizeddigital.com slash meetup. That will redirect you to the much longer URL. And you can go to a section and you can see recordings for past meetups. It takes us about two weeks to get corrected. We edit the video and then we get corrected captions and a full transcript. Once we have those available, then we will publish um, the video. Uh, but it is being recorded and it will be available at that website then. Um, to get notified when the recording is available and get notices of other upcoming meetup events, you can join our email list if you go to equalizeddigital.com slash focus dash state. You also should maybe get redirected to a thank you page after the webinar where you can subscribe if you're not already subscribed. Um, and then you'll get reminders of upcoming events and also get links and information to the recordings and other interesting web accessibility articles from around the web. Uh, we are still seeking some additional sponsors for the meetup in 2023. If you would be interested in helping to sponsor, please reach out. Um, unfortunately, the WordPress Foundation does not have funding to cover the cost of live captioning for um, ASL, which we've had at times when we have sponsors for that. Um, so we are always looking for people that can help us. Of course, you know, sometimes my company covers the cost of the captioning, but if there's other people in the community that are interested in supporting that, please reach out um, to us. There's also information about that on the same website or the web page where you can find the recordings, what the costs are. Um, if you have any suggestions for the meetup or you need any accommodations or if you'd be interested in speaking, I know we're booking speakers right now for April, I believe. Um, feel free to reach out to us. You can email myself and Paula at meetup at equalizeddigital.com. And that is how you can get in touch with us. We love feedback. Um, and of course, we are very interested in finding speakers. Um, so please reach out to us. Who am I? Uh, I mentioned a little bit about our website. You can find the recordings on there, but my company is called Equalize Digital and my name is Amber Hines. And we basically are a company that focuses in WordPress accessibility. It's a passion of ours. That's all we do. We do accessibility audits and remediation. We do website build from an accessibility first perspective. And we have a plugin called um, we have a plugin called Accessibility Checker that can be used to find some accessibility issues on website. Not all automated tools can find, automated tools can't find all issues, but they can find some. And so there's a free version of it that you can try on wordpress.org or you can get the free one off our website. Um, I did notice, I'm going to pause here for a second because I noticed a question come into the chat just verifying that everyone's muted and the cameras are off. Yes, that is correct. Um, attendees, we can't see you and you won't be able to speak um, since we are using the Zoom webinars platform. Um, so no one has to worry about that. Uh, so if you do have questions on that front, you'll need to use the chat or the Q&A, which we'll talk about in just a minute. We have two sponsors today that I want to thank. Uh, our live captions are sponsored by Accessicart. Accessicart is a company that specializes in WooCommerce accessibility. Uh, they do strategy assessments and consulting. Uh, if you have an e-commerce store and you want to have someone go through your processes and prepare a detailed report about its accessibility issues or help you create a prior a prioritization plan for fixing it and making it work better for everyone, they are a great company to reach out to. You can learn more about Accessicart at accessicart.com. It's A-C-C-E. 
E S S I C A R T dot com. Uh, if you're on Twitter, they are at Excessacart on Twitter. We always like to encourage people to tweet a thank you to our sponsors for sponsoring so that they know that it's important and that um, people appreciate it. And that helps to encourage them to um, want to sponsor again in the future. And then we also have to thank Empire Caption Solutions. Empire Caption Solutions has donated their services to the meetup to do um, transcription and creating our captions file that we need in order to upload to the YouTube video after it's done to ensure we have accurate captions and an accurate transcript. So we very much appreciate that they have done that. Um, in addition to doing post event um, on pre-recorded media transcription, they do it for uh, podcasts as well. They do audio description, which we're going to have a talk about audio description coming up next. If you want to learn more about that, come back to a future meetup. And they do ASL interpretation. They did all of that for the WP Accessibility Day. So they're a great company. We very much appreciate them. If you want to learn more about them, you can learn more at empirecaptions.com or they're on Twitter, sort of. <laughs> they don't use it a lot, but it doesn't hurt to tweet them a thank you as well. And it's at Empire Caption. We have two upcoming events that I want to make sure everyone is aware of. I just mentioned that we're going to have a talk on audio description. Uh, so Joel Snyder, who's been doing audio description for a long time, is going to be talking about um, what audio description is, how to create quality audio descriptions. And if the short of that, if you're not familiar, is it is an alternative soundtrack that can be added to video that describes what is happening visually in the video so that people who are not sighted or perhaps are just listening to the video will know what is going on. Um, so he'll be talking on Monday, January 16th at 7 p.m. U.S. Central Time. And then our next talk in the same time slot on Thursday, February 2nd at 10 a.m. U.S. Central Time uh, will be Steve Jones, who also works with me as my partner at Equalize Digital. And he'll be talking about the anatomy of an accessible nav or navigation menu on a website. And that will be a little bit more of what I would consider a developer-focused topic. We'll be probably talking about and looking at some code. So if you have developers or if you are a developer who'd be interested, that's a good one to come to. And now I am very excited to introduce our speaker. Um, she gave me permission just to call her Anne Bovalet, but Anne, Anne Mika Bovalet. Uh, she's a passionate multilingual accessibility and possibility advocate from Germany. She was born in 1971 in the Netherlands and in a long lineage of visual artists, sculptures, musicians, and nutty professors, um, which I love that there's a great <laughs> uh, background there. Uh, Anne built her first real website in 1998 and has freelanced on the side for years. And in 2008, she took the plunge as a full-time entrepreneur. Uh, she has really worked, I feel like, in focusing in ex inclusive design and content. She likes to debunk myths such as accessible websites are more expensive or you can't create really great designs if it's an accessible website. Um, I've had the opportunity to hear her speak at a few different places, and I was super excited when she agreed to come and speak for us because I think she's going to share some really great information today. So welcome, Anne. I'm going to stop sharing my screen, and I will let you take over sharing. All right. Hello, everyone. It's really great to be here. I can't tell you how excited I am, how many people joined today, um, especially the, like what Amber said, after the holidays. Um, absolutely fantastic. I'm going to share my screen now. Yeah, and let me just say real quick as you're getting that up, um, if you have Q&A, please, there is a Q&A module. I will try to watch the chat, but with this many people, questions can frequently get lost in the chat. So please do um, add them to the Q&A module in Zoom, and we will get to those in just a little bit. Okay, so I've been speaking um, for a lot of audiences, and actually this time I chose the topic to speak to 
team leads and future team leads of design and development teams in several companies. And it doesn't really matter whether you are working in a small company or a large company, or even if you are a freelancer who has to work together with others, which can be a lot of fun. Um, well, Amber already told a lot about me. Um, I was born and raised in the Netherlands, and um, I'm smacking around with a lot of very Dutch expressions. Someone told me your, your sayings are absolutely crazy, so I will try and um, explain them as much as I can. Um, and one of very important thing you need to know about me is that my parents taught me to think in possibilities. So I was practically raised not without fear, but um, I was taught that if you want something, don't start to think about how what can go wrong or what is bad or what is dangerous. But what do I have to do to get there? And these problems, we call them bears on the road. And um, my mother once said to me, you know, Anne, if you see a bear in the road, <laughs> you got to hug it to death. Now, why is this so important? Because this is actually a very important trait in um, speaking and teaching about accessibility. Because for a lot of people, this is a really scary topic. I mean, I'm not telling you anything new by that, but this presentation is going to be about saying yes and not saying no. Now, um, a lot of people seem to think I've been in accessibility for many, 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 many years, which is not the case. I created my first website in 1998, and I felt really old when I realized that again. I started for myself in 2008, but it took me to 2021 to understand that I knew virtually nothing about online accessibility. And really, you need to take note of that because you are also running into designers and developers, content creators, people around you who have no clue what it means. Um, my knowledge stopped at you need to have your heading order and you need to do good alt descriptions. So when I finally figured out that there's a lot more to it, I started to learn. And if you try to learn all this at once, it's very steep. It can be very discouraging. And again, that is what this presentation is about, to take away the discouragement. Because that is what gives you counter arguments. So what you will learn today in the end is how you can motivate developers, how you can motivate designers, and how you can use that knowledge to motivate decision makers. I know some of you came here thinking, oh, I'm going to get all the selling arguments for customers to, to sell them accessible websites. But you will have to work for that. And what I'm showing you today and what we're discussing today is bringing you the ideas, the inspiration of how you can do that. Okay, so like I said, this is targeted at team leads and people leading people into creating accessible websites, apps, uh, shops. And um, I'm assuming you already have a solid understanding of online accessibility and you are the one who has to take the lead. I can be very confrontational Maybe this has to do with the fact that I'm Dutch. I'm just very direct. Um, I say some pretty graphic things every now and then. If I say something that offends you or anything, it's not personal. And please get back to me if if there is something eating you about it. Okay. Um, a very important subject and part of this presentation is about psychology. Because accessibility is a topic that stirs up a lot of emotion in so many regions, okay? Now, and the examples that I'm sharing are based on my experience. My experience in the past one and a half years where I literally worked day and night to learn what I know now, and I still think I don't know the half of it, but that's the job. Anyway, but you may have other experiences that you have questions about. So at the end of the presentation, do not hesitate to ask, okay? 
also at the end of my presentation, you get to share your arguments because the arguments that I run into or run into may not be the ones that you run into. And there's absolutely no remark too stupid. Okay, so feel free to, to bring on every argument. But again, remember, this is mainly about arguments between developers and designers and their team leads. If you profit from this by hearing things that you can take to your customers, this is great but this is between the teams themselves. So what I would like to ask you is to make a list of a maximum of three arguments that you find really hard to counter, okay? I would ask of you to do that now. And the reason is, if you do it now, I would like to know in the end of the presentation, if you have been inspired by this and know a way that you figured out by yourself because of what I'm telling you of how you could counter it. And if you end up with arguments where you say, yeah, well, I can't counter this when they say this or they say that, what can I say? How can I motivate them? Go ahead. You get to ask your questions. You get to present your argument. Okay. So now, because I know that not everybody here is, working as I, uh, uh, I'm i targeting, um, I'm going to list a couple of things. Some of them may be setting the obvious to you. Some of them may not, but I just need to get everybody on the same page here, okay? So when you first start talking to designers and developers, like, okay, we have to make stuff accessible. Whatever you are doing is not accessible. Um, the first response of course is disbelief they're like it works for me and I don't want to do age discrimination or anything but I learned that it's very often the younger people who respond like this and this is not only because uh, when you're young you still have all your faculties maybe you are are one of the lucky people who does not have a disability um, but also you fell into a lot of modern code frameworks. You're not one of those dinosaurs like I am. I am 51 who actually wrote code by hand. Another argument you get, well, <laughs> why do we have to have to bother with accessibility? We don't have disabled visitors, users, customers, or people get mad. They go like, what? I've been doing this for so many years and no one ever complained. You're actually telling me that that what I do isn't right? Are you saying I'm a bad designer? How dare you? Or, hey, the worst, guys. Ha, ah, you know there's a plugin for that, right? I mean, I'm talking about those notorious overlay plugins. I'm not going to get into those plugins right now. I'm just going to say, note down, Overlay factsheet.com. If you haven't heard of those before, read that. Okay. This is also something you can send your people out to read. Then you get a lot of resentment because people feel they are being restricted. You start talking about, well, it has to be accessible so you cannot do this and you cannot do that and you cannot use that feature and you cannot use that tool i mean nobody likes to be told what he can't do it goes against our psychology in general there's little as the capacity i don't even know how to say the word decapacitating as no 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 it's very demotivating when you really are not sure if you're doing it right. And, and you come to your team leader and you say, look, I created this. And the team lead goes like, yeah, that sucks. Or you don't understand it. Or why didn't you read up? Or why didn't you? It's all no, did, not, no. Be aware when you speak to your team and the people you work with of your language, are you speaking in what they cannot do? Or are you speaking in what they can do? I know I go hawk on people who keep telling me what I cannot do. Then 
people start out of uh, start crawling back because of fear of repercussions. You know, um, I know uh, more in the U.S. than in Europe. Um, the legal liability um, is pretty strong. Also in Canada, um, I know there are companies doing hard sales uh, based on that. But fear is the worst enemy of creativity there is. Have you ever created a fear design? <laughs> I did. My website is an example of that. I mean, this was the safest design I could think of because I had to whip it out in a couple of weeks. Um, I'm currently working on this new website and you have a premiere, actually, um, the logo on the top left. No one in the world has seen that yet. Um, you do? It's going to be very colorful. But that aside, um, back to legal liability. People think we can get sued if it's not done right. And then you start crawling into yourself. So if you're working with a team who just got the assignment, listen, um, we got sued and we need to have an accessible website like yesterday and everything needs to be fixed. People are going to start to color between lines that are within lines. Again, they feel you cannot do this or you cannot do that, but it's about the possibilities. And it's up to you to counter this fear and worry and this, this I would always almost call it a probably non-existent word in English. I would call it discreativity because people are afraid they get fired if they don't do it right. And then there's fear of the unknown. I mean, it's overwhelming. The documentation for, for accessibility is drier than the Sahara in midsummer. And for several reasons, even for me, I have this weird form of dyslexia. I have ADHD. I mean, give me a, a pile of text longer than 20 lines and I'm gone. And um, I think a lot of people who work in creative jobs, whether it's coding or designing, um, are people who tend to go into full focus on of creation and learning all this dry stuff is like, it's drying up the well. And there's this other thing, we always try to be perfect. So we feel like we have to know and we have to understand all of it. I remember the day I pressed the button on my, my current website and I had seven collars in my pants. Again, it's a very Dutch expression because I thought people are going to come and they're not going to shoot me down because they're like errors here and errors there. And probably this thing has errors because I was uh, making this in, in a page builder. Um, but at some point, you have to let go. You're doing your best. And it's it's for you to motivate your team into doing their best and into acknowledging that there is stuff that they don't know. It's okay to not know something. It is not okay to tell somebody to bugger off because you're trying to hide that you don't know something. And this is where all the counter arguments are coming from. Okay. So like I said, we're going into a little bit of psychology, right? Everybody wants to be liked. Let me set that up. Everybody wants to be loved. Getting told that you are not doing it right or giving someone the feeling like they are Bambi on ice. You know, I don't know who of you has seen or heard Bambi. Um, Bambi was a reindeer and he tried to walk on ice and he was just squibbling all over the place. And again, some of you might wonder, why is she telling this? Of course, everybody here knows Bambi. Well, I can tell you not everybody knows Bambi. I know for a fact that a friend of mine is here. His name is Lazar, and Lazar is blind. I don't know if Lazar ever experienced Bambi. But I think Lazar experienced walking on ice. Well, so this is actually quite a good example of how you as a team lead 
guide your people into understanding that you know what they are going through. Okay. People identify with what they do for a living. And I think this goes especially for creative people. When you are creating stuff, when you are making stuff work, you are giving a part of yourself, of your soul. And if you give someone a feeling that they're not good or not good enough of, at what they do, that is detrimental. It, that is what gets them to shut down on you. And shutting down is not turning quiet. Shutting down is getting up front like, yeah, sure, you can automate that. Or um, can't they ask someone to navigate the site for them if someone can't use the site? It gets you all kind of no. When you give in a no, you get one out. Okay, so the basis for countering voiced and unvoiced arguments is something a lot of people would say, oh, you're getting all psycho on, but you're getting all so, so spiritual. But, you know, fact is love and empathy. Everybody needs and wants love and empathy, whether it is you designing a site or coding a site or you doing that with your team or you being the one on the receiving end i'm on the receiving end a lot i have adhd on steroids i can't focus for more than five minutes if it is a subject that doesn't really have my biggest passion at that moment um i can't see very well so when text is small and 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 gray and has bad contrast, I feel unseen. I feel there has been no empathy for me and my fellow users whatsoever from whoever designed that website. I get to feel like, oh my, they really don't care, do they? It's very important that you clarify to the people you work with, the joy of what you can do, of what can be done, instead of what can't be done. Because can't is unproductive. Okay? So now think back of all the arguments you people whoop around your ears. How many of these arguments can you already say, yeah, they're worried that they are not doing it right, or hmm, maybe I should have clarified that. Well, one of the most important things I think is in countering arguments, or maybe it's better to say not countering arguments, but to, to make sure people do not argue with you over certain things. I think that's better. Um, is making them understand the why. And your why is not my why. And my why is not my blind friend's why or my mother of 76 who tried to change banks and she could not. So the why. And this is why I said I'm assuming you already know a lot about accessibility because if you understand accessible design and accessible coding you could actually be a master of explaining why from a practical point okay because saying because i say so <laughs> it's not really a great argument and of course um making things accessible you should do it because it's the right thing to do but if you work with a team of new developers, new designers, or the whole topic is new to them, it's not as solid as you think because people are having their center of the universe in here and in here, okay? So if you just say to someone, yeah, it's the right thing to do, they still don't know why. If they cannot relate, they don't know why. If I tell them you have to make your 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 text, uh, your paragraph text, 
at least um, the equivalent of 18 pixels or larger and use REM or M or whatever to get it to, into tech. Um, they're still, they still won't know why it's the right thing to do. So, and like I said, your why may differ from their why. And this is where we get um, to another point, because I know when you are leading design and development teams um, and you have to talk to marketing, there is this whole hierarchy. There is a manager over your head and another one and another one. Or if you're a freelancer, you have a customer who has a manager who has, there's always someone up there uh, trying to call the shots and, and trying to get you into doing what they think is right. And when they have no clue what it means to make a site accessible, or if their only motivation is like, yeah, it's for legal reasons, they're not going to get it right. Okay, you know that, but your team doesn't know the why of that. Not really. The only time I believe you learn the why of something is if you get to relate, if you get to experience. So... I think it's important that you find out what the people in your team do understand and what they do not understand, and then project that. Because you may be dealing with different age groups, very young developers and designers to people of my age who've always been used to doing things a certain way. Both these groups get very insecure when you just tell them what to do and uh, you keep telling them what they did is wrong. So, yeah. So, how can you prevent arguments from people? Take what they know. Make them relate. And um, I could have gotten you a list, you know, of apps and tools and whatever you can use uh, filters in Chrome to see what to show what things look like for someone who's colorblind. You can show what something looks like when they are very um, sensitive to light. Um, you can, I could have uh, sent you uh, a list of links to how do you get to keyboard test something or how do you, but you already know that because I'm talking to you, the ones who have to deal with the arguments not the ones who are still learning, okay? Now, we have something in Dutch where we say, oh, this is way too far from my bed. I don't know what the, the English equivalent of it is, but it's like, I don't, it's, it's not my world, so I don't know. It's not important to me. Make it come close to home. I had a meeting a while back with a team who uh, uh, want to uh, recreate some sort of scoring system online. And the first thing I asked them is, how many of you wear glasses or contacts? And in fact, all of them turned out to wear contacts or glasses. Well, the glasses were obvious, but the contacts were not. So. Bam, that's where you have them. Ask people, can you see or read anything if you take out these contacts? Because the people you get these arguments from, the people that want to, to debate with you whether why you shouldn't do anything to make something accessible or what or want to know why it's important. Um, they're usually the people who do not have to deal with being disabled, being old, um, being so tired that everything is glaring, you know, this, you know, this feeling you come home and you want to turn down the lights because everything is just going, <laughs> right? So this is why I keep saying, relate to something that they know and then make it bigger. So ask them if they wear glasses, ask them about hearing. You will you will be surprised if you have people if people trust you and they should be able to trust you. I mean, if you're a good manager and team lead, people trust you, 
right? Ask them if they are able to have a good conversation uh, with someone when there is a lot of noise in the background. I live in Germany. One of the things that absolutely drives me bonkers around here is if you watch something on TV and they're not subtitling things, they're dubbing things. And then they have the original language in the background and the German in the foreground. And I have to turn off the channel because I cannot listen to it. Now, you will find if you ask people that, like, can you have a good conversation in a discotheque? Or how do you feel if five people at the same time try and talk to you and you have to form a decision about something? How do you feel? I'd be really surprised if people then tell you, oh, yeah, it's very easy. I can do it like that. No problem. I can focus like a madman. I never heard anyone say it. If they can relate to that, they can relate or you can make them relate to the fact that if you design a website that has a ton of moving elements, that this actually gives the same feeling as a ton of people talking through each other's. I don't know how you say this in English. I'm sorry. When they just keep interrupting each other, it's the same effect. So relate, relate, relate. Fatigue um, or um, something else if they're like, keep saying, yeah, yeah, no, no, I don't have all these problems. I'm Superman or Superwoman or super them. Take the horrible plastic packaging, you know, this this stuff where you want to buy a USB stick and it's it's into plastic so tough that you actually need a concrete cutter to open it. If you start talking about that, they're like, yeah, I know. I bought this or I bought that. They can relate. Relate that back to something, to a website or an app that is inaccessible. I don't have to give you those examples of inaccessibility because you already know them. It's up to you to teach the others. Or the example of the shop with no labels. Just ask them, can you imagine going into a supermarket and all you see is the price, but the labels are white? People will go like, you're talking nonsense. That would never happen. And you can explain to them, of course it happens. It happens on the web. It happens in a web shop where you can't read the description or where someone using assistive technology like a screen reader doesn't get these descriptions read. Okay, so this is where you start. You peak interest. You relate. Okay. And then there is what they think they know. But you are the one who knows what can go wrong. They don't. So make them experience that by themselves because you don't want to counter arguments. You want to prevent them. A good thing is make people find a web shop. I prefer to take web shops for several reasons um, because a web shop has even more reason if you take it from a capitalistic greedy way to be accessible than a regular site. I mean, every site should be accessible, but a web shop actually loses money. Okay, if you cannot navigate a web shop by keyboard, you as a site owner, you, lo you, you lose money. So, and there are shops that make a lot of profit more than usual because they are accessible. This is just the regular market. Either what you offer is great and your experience is great or it's not. Okay. But a lot of people in your team who are new to accessibility, who are questioning of the, what, the why, they have to experience that. So my challenge and my homework for you would be find shops and sites that suck where it comes to accessibility and find those that are great. Okay. And then take half a day or a day off with your team 
tell your boss or whoever is paying for the job that that day off is part of the process. Okay. And that day you're going to workshop your people like crazy. Make your team shop by keyboard. It's not fair to make them shop with a screen reader the first time because learning how to use a screen reader, man, I'm still at it. Um, if you want to see how people experience the world when they use a screen reader, if you want to show that, ask someone who uses a screen reader on a daily basis, invest in that, invest in it. Really do not save money in the process of learning how to make a site accessible. Okay. Now, people will start feeling dumb, right? When you bring up accessibility and they, they, again, they start to learn that they don't, that, or why, how should I say it? They start to realize that there is a lot of stuff that they don't know. And it's going to make them very insecure. It can make them so insecure that they start to question everything, which isn't right because you work with that designer because that's a great designer and you work with that developer because this, that is a great developer. Okay. So make sure you keep that on top of everything. You, you keep them aware that you know that they are good at what they're doing as far as they were doing it, but that it's time to learn new stuff. Okay. So when you, Take them through this process of, of testing a website and take out the whole bag of tools that you have. The ones I was talking about, these simulators in, in, in Chrome, um, and there are apps on your phone for that. Make them experience the world through the eyes and, and the ears of someone who has a disability. Um, there's a great tool called polypane that tool can even show you how dyslexia what it looks like you know and still realize that all these tools are only showing you a little bit it's not the real thing but when you do this with your team make them run into the wall make them shop by keyboard on a completely inaccessible website a developer will start inspecting the source code. I've seen developers go like, ah, oh, I do that too. I didn't know that. The moment this happened, they're not going to bitch at you. Why should I make it like that? They experienced it. Okay. And the same is with design. Make them see the world through the eyes of people with visual disabilities and make it clear that this also concerns their grandparents and at some point themselves. It's the same, something that I learned. I mean, I was blown away when I heard that. When people can't hear, the way they experience text, the way they read text is different. So if you know what can go wrong with accessibility, you can cook up any kind of example to make the people you work with experience at least part of it. And then you challenge them in all their talent and all their skills to go figure out how that could have been better. Okay. And find great metaphors, find stuff that people understand. Um, uh, you know, and this is where I warned you, this is where it gets rough. I mean, I have uh, given examples of people who went to a restaurant and ate something bad and suddenly they had to go to the bathroom, you know, like, hmm? but they couldn't find the bathroom because they are in this big building with a lot of halls and the signage sucks. Do you know what a disgrace that is? How, how humiliating that is? If you have to do it in your pants because someone in that building didn't make the right signage. Now, imagine it's not you having to go to the bathroom, but it's you having to pay the tax office. I mean, in, in Europe, 
in every country it's different and it's a catastrophe everywhere they're working on it and working on it and working on it it's still a catastrophe okay and imagine you know i have to get this done i have to tell the tax office i made this much money or i didn't make this much money if i cannot get file those papers or those numbers i'm going to get a fine can you imagine the fear and the pressure if you cannot operate that website because you cannot operate a mouse or because your screen reader isn't working or or simply because you are overwhelmed by all the colors and the buttons and the whatchamacallit. Can you imagine? That really sucks. I actually don't have to tell you that because you know that. But this is what you should tell the people you work with, the ones who are trying to bring arguments to you against accessibility. And accessibility is not only for the disabled. Accessibility is for everybody. And it's up to you to bring that. This is how you counter arguments. Okay? And then Again, show them their power. Actually, the web designers and developers, they are the kings and the queens and the magicians on the web. Acknowledge that. If someone has been doing the thing, uh, his, his job in the same way, using this, this very lousy framework that only use hoes, uh, sorry, divs, you know, this developer probably doesn't know that he's not doing something right because especially the younger generation is not getting educated right. This is something that has to change, okay? But they are still the kings, the queens, and the magicians because they have the power to do better. When they see that if they, for example, take a forum, Okay, there's always a lot of discussions about forums. Ah, eh, labels are ugly. Mm. Um, or um, I want that checkbox to have a different shape or, or whatever. And, and you make them discover that with that, they make a forum unusable to a lot of people. And you show them how they can make it usable. And you challenge them to and do a great design and use labels and do everything great under the hood, they'll feel good about themselves. I know I feel good about myself. And I mean, I'm not even a hardcore developer. I'm, I know just about enough about development to be really dangerous and do really stupid things. Anyway, they have the power to change things for the better. So please make them and keep them aware of that. Show them that they can take great pride in their work on a human level on a creative level, on a commercial and financial level. I mean, okay, let's let's take the rank up a little bit, right? Um, you are the design and development team lead, and you have to discuss with the company CTO. Hmm. Okay. Um, for those who think, what's a CTO? Because I know we have this crazy habit to use acronyms for everything all the time. A CTO is a chief technical officer, okay? Um, this CTO is getting hammered from the top, like, okay, we have to do this. We have to realize this. It doesn't have to, it shouldn't cost this much. Um, get it fixed, get it done. We're, we're, we're getting fined or we're getting whatever, or we're not making enough turnover because our site is not accessible or whatever, okay? Um, they will want to defend their post. Because they are responsible for budget, but they also need to get it done. Those are people you can also get arguments from. Those are difficult people to talk to because they're like me. Most of them know just enough to be really dangerous, okay? Where it comes to code stuff, design stuff, technical stuff. And on the other hand, it's not that hard. If, if 
a CTO comes down on your head and says, listen, this just needs to happen. And um, this thing has to go online and we have to make, make turnover with this. You can get angry. You can go into not, don't, do not. And, and say, okay, so who's going to tell the boss that he's losing out on turnover, you and me? Instead of saying that, just say, don't you want to be able to tell the boss that we're going to do a lot more turnover if we do it right from the start? It's a whole different tone of voice. Okay? So, again, show them they can take great pride in their work. On a human level, on a creative level, and also on a commercial and a financial level. Okay? And then there is translation and teamwork. Web designers and developers, they do not always speak the same language. Um, I don't mean it disgraceful because I actually have a domain name called Geek on Heels. I would call developers do geek speak. Okay. Now, things can get very literal, especially for developers. I've been part of a development team, an open source development team, where I would follow the discussions between the designers, the marketers, and the developers, and they would go Babylonic on each other like that. Bam. Okay. And they were fighting. I have heard people screaming on the floor. It's, it's very discomforting, actually. But it's up to you to bring them together because if you bring them together and you too are part of that team, you get this we situation. We can, we will. And it takes a basic understanding of each other's work. Okay. So um, some people roll into uh, design, but they actually don't think in grids. But there's a reason why it's really good to think in grids, because if something is in a in a grid design, it's easier to code and to unify code unify coding. You with development experience, you know that. But a designer maybe doesn't know that, or the designer has been hit on by their customer who said, "Oh, I want to have this really flipped out design, and I'm the one paying the money." I'm paying so much money. You have to do everything I say. Okay. This can potentially divide your team. Don't let it. Keep the people you work with and the teams you depend on. Keep them together. And um, I have this story. It's on my website. So I'm going to look the other way because I have it there on my screen. That has, um, well, that has a lot of meaning to me uh, when I try to explain this to others. I call it the story of the $160 button. Because if you're creating stuff for the web, it's not, on one hand, a designer should be able to stick to the design and the developer should be able to stick to the development. But if you do not have this general understanding of how the whole process works, if nobody ever shows you, you're missing out on a lot of information. And this is also very expensive. And um, how do I say it? Small changes happen through love. Big changes happen through greed and capitalism. Okay. And this may be like a strange turn, but this is where I get to the turn where if you are working with people who keep countering uh, uh, or who keep arguing with you, you over accessibility. Um, maybe that team needs more education. Maybe there needs money to be invested in educating the team. And it doesn't matter whether you are a freelancer or if you are working for what you might call it, big agency. It costs money. Debate, discussions, fights, negativity. It all costs, directly, but mostly indirectly. So semantics is 
the holy grail to me. Okay, in code. Anyone developing accessible sites and apps knows that. All right. But then there is also terminology. And this is where we get to language. Okay. So the conversation I'm describing there is a marketer coming to a developer and saying, hey, um, you need to change that menu item as soon as you can. It, it has to be twice as big and it has to be green. And the developer is like, what menu item? Well, the third one. I don't see a menu item. Of course you do. You made it. Nah, I never made menu items. Man, I mailed you a screenshot and a detailed explanation this morning. Oh, that. Yeah, I studied that for a while. It was a lot of text. That's a button with a pop-up. It's not a menu item. That's not for me to change just like that. You have to talk to the design department. I would have mailed you that answer this afternoon. I answer my email only twice a day. Good for him or her. Okay. But that conversation was very expensive. At first sight, that button cost 55 euros, okay? Because the developer who charges, he charges 110 per hour. Dutifully locked that as out of scope. And um, so half an hour of that time was 55 euros. But in fact, that button cost 160 euros. How? This is where it comes to translating and mutual understanding. You have to understand or teach your people that they are part of a larger process, not just what they do. They should focus on what they do, but they have to understand that they are part of that process. That marketer that is not even an integrated part of the team, but someone who has influence from the outside, wasted hours, okay? Um, I don't know what it costs in other countries, but I've been a recruiter for eight years and I know what it would have cost in the Netherlands, right? So, um, and I am calculating that in salary in this article. And this is how I end up thinking this button cost $160. But that $160 or euros you could have had half an afternoon have someone who lives being disabled, someone who is blind or someone who is deaf or, or anything you want to have shown to you to see what it's like if they operate a website or an app. You could have invited this person over and paid him or her for that time. Because that too is very important when you get arguments, teach your team who they are working for, who they are working with. Okay. I stated here in this list, what if that button actually cost $20,000 or 20,000 euros <laughs> these days? The difference is not that big. Well, if that button is not working because it's a, faulty checkout, then a lot of people couldn't order and pay for what they wanted to buy. So then a lousy button is easily $20,000 in damages or even more. I mean, I leave it up to your imagination how big you want to make this example. Most important, you are part of a team. If you work for a company or in a company, never forget, they are paying your bills. They are paying your salary. They're paying your fee. And you would think, okay, we have to be nice to them and say, yes, sir. No, sir. Yes, ma'am. No, ma'am. We'll do anything you want. But you know, if you're into accessibility, 
that you carry this responsibility to help them make the right decision. And that starts with your own teams. You do it together. Never forget that. So um, I see it's uh, six o'clock here in the evening. I've been yapping here for an hour. So I think it's time to, um, to bring on the arguments. And I will start. And then um, I'm going to ask you and ask Amber to moderate that to if you have questions or if you have arguments that you don't think you can answer based on what I've been telling you here today. So one of the meanest I get is, oh, in design, when I say, no, you can't use that color on a white background because the contrast is lousy. Well, then they go like, this is how they always use their corporate collars, or this is how we always use their, our corporate collars. I mean, it can also happen to you that you as a development team have to work with a marketing agency that goes hulk on you over what you're saying, right? How do you counter that? You do the same thing. Show them what it's like for someone with lower vision. Show them what it's like for someone who is colorblind. Show them that green and orange look the same when people have red, green colorblindness, for example. Again, you should know all these examples because you are into accessibility. You know what it's, why it's important. And if you need ways to learn how to, to give examples, come find me. Okay. The next one, the design. Labels are ugly. Okay, well, create a form for them that has no labels. Okay, and then have them run a screen reader. Because using a screen reader for something um, as basic as a form is something you can do. Whether you do it on Windows or on Mac or whatever, it's one of the simpler things of a screen reader. Operating a screen reader is a whole world in itself. But that you can do. So if people say labels are ugly and you say, but they need to be in there um, and they finally understand they can be in there, um, challenge the designer to create a whole new form. Make sure they are not afraid to bring on new designs because accessibility it's a verb. It's not just a phrase. It's a verb. It's something you do. Okay. And then there's another one. Developers. Yeah, we will develop those features first and then we will make it accessible afterwards. Okay. This is where I always look. Who am I dealing with here? Am I dealing with the the CTO? Am I dealing with the development team itself? Um, is there anyone here who I can make understand that it's actually very costly what they're doing there? This is what gives accessibility a bad rap, right? Because they're baking cookies and then expect they can put in the sugar and the salt after they've been baked. Okay. This is that one of those arguments where I will counter with Okay, so wouldn't you want to tell our boss or our client that they can make a lot more money when they do it in an accessible way? Because also for the client or your boss, don't do cannot, can't. Don't use fear, use positive things, okay? So my throat is raw <laughs> and... um. I think it's your turn. That was really great. And thank you. I got, I saw tons of really good feedback coming in, in the chat. Um, someone did post, so we don't have any questions yet. If anyone has questions for Anne, feel free to add them in the Q and a um, widget and I can share them with her. Um, of course, she's also interested in hearing other arguments that you've come up against, especially if there's any that you're not sure how to respond to. We'd be happy to discuss those. Um, so one person did say three arguments that I've heard, they've heard, 
is the first one was blind users can visit one of our offices to get help signing the forms instead of doing it on the web, right? So they have to come <laughs> to an office. Okay. Uh, the second one was, we don't have time to make this accessible now. We can do later, which I know you've already addressed. Mm -hmm. And then and then three was just, they just say, this is better design. Like, it's just better. <laughs> so I don't know if you have any thoughts about those. Maybe we should start with the first one. Uh, blind people can just come to the office instead of using the website. <laughs> oh, that one. I love that one. Yeah. Okay. Imagine this is your bloody tax return. <laughs> Imagine yeah. you... You are, you are like me, you suck at administration and you're always on the last rank. And I mean, um, especially if someone is blind at doing the administration is probably a lot harder. Uh, so it's been hard. It's been hard. And then you realize it's your last day, but let's say it's you, it's you, you're not the blind person. It's you, you, you have, you have not been able to do your administration in a timely manner for whatever reason. Okay. And then you cannot do it on the website. You cannot do it online. Instead, you get this message saying, come to our office on Monday. And you know, it's Friday. And if you don't put that in by Friday, you're going to find something else in your inbox. Right. Saying you're late. You're fine. Do you still think you can request that from people? Or do you think you can, uh, uh, or say, imagine it's like, it's like, again, but the story of the food, man, you have to go to the bathroom so bad. And someone says, no, no, you can't use this bathroom. You know, use the bathroom on the other side of town. Yeah. How would that make you feel? Yeah, I think drawing those, I think too, on that kind of argument, the going into the office, and we'll talk a minute on the side note on that of Josh said in chat, they can just call in for help. But but I do want to say something about going into the office that I think many people, like, it might se seem easy for a typically able, wealthy person that owns a vehicle <laughs> mm. to go to an office. And, you know, you can take time off work. You can drive yourself there and you can do it during the time that the office is open. But someone who doesn't have their own vehicle, who doesn't have freedom and whether or not they're an able person or not, freedom to take time off their job during the hours in which the office is open, or someone who is in, in able to drive themselves and they have to rely on someone else to drive them or public transportation, which may or may not work. And I think once you start saying those kinds of things, like then they click, it's like, oh, this could also be an extra cost for them. Now they have yeah. to pay an Uber because they don't have a family member who, or a friend who's willing to drive them. And so now you're adding a cost. Like, mm -hmm. I think when you start spelling that kind of stuff out, it, it's helpful to like emphasize why like coming in in person, just, it doesn't really work. And yeah. I mean, is the office even open 24 hours a day? Like what if someone works the night shifts? <laughs> yeah. Like it'd be convenient for them to come in at 1 a.m. Does that work yeah. for you? Would you like to come in and, <laughs> and serve yeah. them in your office at 1 a.m.? So, I mean, we always talk to you about cutting costs and like allowing people to self-serve on the web reduces the staffing requirements. Like even the number of people available to do tech support I mean, that's why every time we, we have a tech support question, it's like, have you read the documentation, right? Like, because yeah. like before you can chat with them or before you can submit your support ticket, because it requires man hours, which costs the business money to respond to support. Yeah. So wouldn't it be better if things just worked and then you didn't have to have a human being helping people? But you see, but <laughs> this is horrible. This we don't want to be human helping people. But yeah, but time. <laughs> this is what I'm talking about. This is painting yeah. the big picture. This is showing people... You are part of a bigger picture. And um, I can't help but seeing Glenn Work is saying something wonderful. <laughs> he says, if a developer finds out that the way they're coding something is preventing someone from using the website, they're typically very motivated to fix it. Yeah. A lot yeah, of so developers really are. Explaining it, right? And making yeah. it more visible. Yeah. Yeah. On the phone front. 
I think it's the same scenario, right? Mm. Cost of people answering the phone, but also the big thing here in the US was the Domino's case and Domino's tried to be like, well, they can just call to order pizza, but they were constantly putting people on hold or, you know, maybe they're yeah. not open all the time and you want to order in advance. <laughs> so I don't, I'm pretty sure, I, I don't know if Lainey is still here, um, but I know Lainey Feingold, when she spoke about laws and that kind of stuff, she said that almost never is a phone considered a reasonable alternative to having an accessible website. No, it, it's not. And actually interesting about forms, you know, they're like, like in Europe, we have this thing with GDPR. And um, one of the arguments I got was from a designer and a developer they teamed up on me and they said no 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 we're not going to design in a form into this absolutely not well people hate forms we're not going to do forms and then i said yeah but what if someone can't use the phone what if some someone is shy to use the phone what about that and if you do that, you make people feel very unloved. Like they don't care enough about us to give us a forum. They just expect us to call in. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think it's about giving people multiple options. Like a phone is good for some people, but for other people, it's not. Uh, Lainey is here because I just saw she asked a question. Oh, cool. Uh, so how, how useful do you think friendly competition is? So can you find the most accessible sites in the sector? So maybe even their competitors and... Um, remind the team that they want to be leaders, role models ahead of the pack instead of behind. Do you think that's helpful? Very, very helpful. Just remember, do it from the positive side because the competition is, is of course, you want to be the best, but you want to be the best for your customer, not because you want to be the best company doing something. It's very easy to poo on other people's heads. I call it PP marketing. <laughs> yeah. So yeah, that absolutely is great. Uh, let's see. Someone else asked, how can the value of accessibility be emphasized at a company with a low UX, so user experience maturity, where UX is not valued and is simply viewed as, quote, making it pretty? Uh -huh. that's a good one so are you saying a low low ux is like it doesn't really matter uh if the if the websites works how should i how should i interpret that what kind of customers would they have do they expect conversion on their website mm -hmm. What is conversion? Yeah. This is the first thing you have to define. Define. And um, uh, someone here says um, uh, UX is different from UI. <laughs> this is a whole other discussion, really. But if your UI sucks, your UX sucks even bigger. It's um, just, can we define UI for people who aren't familiar? User UI is a user interface. It's how you actually navigate an app or, or uh, a site. Okay, if the navigation sucks, forget your user experience. So, and again, I actually like that question about um, uh, the importance of the interface or not, because it's really hard to measure, okay? Um, a screen reader is not a browser, so you cannot measure screen readers. This is very important. Most people don't realize it. I think it's one of the first things you have to explain to your team. Um, but you can explain it in another way. It's also, and it's another example I have on my website. I think uh, Paula can probably find it. Um, this is about contrast. It's like this, this bad smell in a store, right? You, you jumping off or walking out of a store or jumping off a website is very often a very um, unconscious process. Or let's take a restaurant because I got this on the site. You can read it. Let, let's do the restaurant. You go to this restaurant and the menu is really fancy and the chairs suck, right? Chances are you're not coming back. Maybe you don't even remember that the chair sucked. You just, you just, or even worse, they have a problem with a sewer, you know, and there is this, 
this smell, it's always there. It's like, it's not so bad that you want to run off, but you're not going to come back. I can tell you that. If someone proposes the same restaurant to you, you're going to go, nah, maybe we'll take another one. And nine out of 10 times, you won't even remember why you're saying that. Okay. This happens to websites. So how important is conversion to you? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Joshua is saying something that I find very interesting. <laughs> Auto fix contrast issues. Hmm. I don't think you can automate contrast issues. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, browsers will be able to auto fix contrast issues with the new CSS update coming out. I don't know much about this, to be honest. So I would have well, to. Well, what I know about contrast is, is yeah. in, in, my, in my naivety in the beginning, I created my website and I thought I want to take the best contrast in the world. I'm going to do white text on black background. That is 10 times A. <laughs> <laughs> and someone said, man, that really sucks. It glares. Too much contrast. <laughs> yeah, it's too much contrast. Yeah. So I worry about that. But um, actually, um, yeah, contrast can be personal, like Liz says. I'm wondering if there is more arguments people do you have arguments that you need a good counter argument for yeah if anyone has those feel free to put them in um so uh deneb asked what's a good tool in chrome or otherwise to simulate various forms of color blindness um that so then they could take a screenshot and illustrate for the brand why not um why it's not working so one that i've used is colorblindly which is a chrome extension it might have a firefox version too a chrome has it built in actually chrome has colorblind yeah. simulation built yes in. but it's but it's incredibly stinky to find would you like me to show you yeah share your screen show us how to do that <laughs> okay ah uh, hang on here we go Greg says it's buried in the dev tools. I, oh yeah, it's this buried. Is why I That's love the, the meetups because yeah. I, I like I I swear I learn something every time. I Chrome is generally the browser that I use for work. I had no idea. Yeah. Okay. Use. Let's first get an image here that is um a lot more work has more color. Okay. Okay. So, so we have a mountain with a blue sky and green background. Or green hang on. Well. It should if it's a an image pop up. It's not. It's not good. Um. I should be able to refresh this. Oh, this one's really nice to show. <laughs> okay. So you go to your dev tools. Can you see that? Does it yes. open for you? Yes, we can see it. Okay. Uh, oh, wait. No, we can see that you open. We can't see dev tools. Do you have dev no, you tools don't in see, a different? You don't window? see dev tools. Hang on oh, here. Yes, now there we, we can go. see dev tools. I hate to do this because I always have to. Search and search and search and search to, to remember where it was. It is here at this terrible user interface. Um, these three dots next to the cogwheel on the top right. Okay. And then you scroll down to more tools. And then you go down. And then you go to rendering. And then you see in very small, unreadable fonts, which I have trouble enlarging. Oh, here we go. You can render all kinds of things. Okay. Emulate a focus page, enable automatic dark mode, media types, vision deficiencies, word vision. Oh, this is my daily life. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, mine too, if I don't have my contacts in. <laughs> okay. So Colorblind. Tarnan, yeah, Protopania. I, I don't know how to pronounce all these, but very I had no idea this was here. This I, is... I don't I think it's not, it's not it hasn't been there very long. Yeah. That's super cool. 
So you so can. I wonder you, if this is in all Chromium browsers. So it might be in Firefox too, because they use kind of the same underlying stuff. Probably. Let me check. I think. I mean, I might have just said something dumb. <laughs> Firefox might not be a Chromium based browser. <laughs> Yeah, there you go. Someone corrected me. I was like, I said it. And then I was like, wait a minute. I don't actually think that's right. <laughs> no, I can't find it that fast. But that is because um, I have this the weirdest form of dyslexia. And if a screen has a certain uh, way of ordering information, I'm gone. I'm out the window. I can't. Mm -hmm. So anyway, so would people like to see it again once more now that I have enlarged this thing? Yeah, I think we saw it. Okay. So, okay. Yeah, that worked out. All right. Cool. More questions? Thank you. Uh, let's see. Joshua at, uh, Joshua said, let's see. I wish randomized IDs were more used for user entering forms like Twitter and applied to all the emojis slash sharing elements that surround it. When multiple tweets are shown, how do you know which one you're liking? I'm guessing maybe in Twitter. They mm -hmm. might have uh, ambiguous. I don't know. I haven't gone through Twitter with a screen reader, but maybe they're ambiguous. Um, so I don't know. If I think. Uh, I think. Um, I think if he's still here, I cannot write in in the chat for some reason. I can only write to hosts and panelists. I don't know. Lazar, are you still here? Uh, I can look and see if Lazar is still here. Uh, I don't see Lazar. No, he's okay. dropped out. Oh, he dropped out. Because Lazar told me he had to install an, a special app to use Twitter. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Where are the questions? You can yeah, pick my know. brain. This is your chance, <laughs> people. I'll give so you the worst metaphors in the world. <laughs> <laughs> so do you... It, uh, do you feel like metaphors are really probably one of the best ways just sort of circling back to what you were saying, like as far as creating arguments, that's being able to draw parallels in that way is what yeah. works the best. Yeah. Yes, because that makes you able to relate. Mm -hmm. And it goes in all kinds of directions. I mean, um, I work with quite a few blind people. Mm -hmm. Um, something a lot of people don't realize about being blind actually is that it's not so common that people don't see anything at all, that the, that the world is just dark. Yeah, um, they might be able to detect lights and yeah. things like that. Mm -hmm. And, and um, sometimes I have to explain to someone who is like what I... I, I know this is, this is wording stuff, but let's say someone is legally blind Okay. Um, now, what a lot of designers, for example, um, uh, and developers neither realize is that someone who can't see very well because he's diabetic or he because he has macular degeneration and he sees he or she sees a big black spot or blotch is going to enlarge the screen. And and um, one of my friends enlarges to three hundred, almost four hundred percent. Mm -hmm. And then you suddenly, on a big screen, you have the mobile view. And this is something very few people realize. And this is a great thing because this is something you can show. You can actually really mm -hmm. paste something around in the middle of the screen and, and make them navigate around a 200 to 400% enlarged uh, screen. Yeah. And... I think once you understand that, you are becoming more conscious. This is why I always say what I'm telling people is very infectious. When I go to a meeting, when I go on stage, one of the first things I say is you cannot unforget what mm -hmm. I'm telling you. Yeah, we do a lot of user testing for clients and we'll always allow them to join. We usually have them in a webinar setting so they can't. Oh, that's great. Work, right. But, but I feel like once they've come and they've been able to watch a, a real user on their website. I think it's one thing to like show them, I think do the metaphors and all that I think is really good. Mm -hmm. And then it's, that's a way to like move them into being open to paying for user testing. Yeah. Right. But like, I feel like once they actually see what it's like for a real person and they can put like a face 
and the name on it. And the same thing for designers and developers. I know mm -hmm. um, Alex Stein and I did a workshop at WordCamp US and a bunch of people were coming up afterwards and they were just blown away. I mean, they're all web professionals yeah. that are at WordCamp US and they were blown away because they had never seen anyone with a screen reader go on a website and they were just like, wow, now I'm thinking twice about everything I've done when I build my yeah. websites or my plugins or my themes or whatever that might yeah. be. So, yeah. But yeah, I think it does make a difference for designers and developers. And I know one thing, like having them watch, even if it's recorded talks or attending meetup or like AxCon, which I know people are on the fence about AxCon, but like AxCon is free and it's it has multiple tracks like for designers and developers and they have users who come there like even if you can't have a custom user testing session for your team having your team attend stuff like that i think is really helpful just yeah. to expose them so yeah so we're we're at 11:32 i haven't seen yeah. any more question oh wait i'm lying i minimized the thing let's see what we can get through really fast in our last like 5 minutes or so um, so Richard said, quote, I know we asked for an accessible website, but we want it to look like this because we think it looks better. <laughs> Is it something that he hears? <laughs> I've got one on my plate right now. <laughs> yeah. I you, know what, you know what I do? I think this goes back to Laney's like finding other websites in their industry. Mm -hmm. And a lot of times I'll even find like bigger brand. Like if you go to something like apple.com or yeah. Right. Like, I'm like, you think they don't know about conversion optimization? There's not a million things moving all over that web page. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So that is, that is a very good one because that is taking it from the positive side. Um, the, the, um, the, uh, the one that I have on my plate right now, I have this argument actually, and I, I killed it. Um, because they said, yeah, well, we've always had this design like that and it has to be that way, but they actually had a lawsuit. Mm. So I'm like, okay, so do you want to be compliant or do you want to caress your designer and tell him how great he is? Because right now what you're saying to me is I hate discrimination and Africans. Yeah. And that is so rude. That is incredibly rude. But that one hit home. Yeah. When they heard you say that, they were like, wait a minute. <laughs> yeah. So that is like, rude. yeah. And this is where I mean, it's, 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 it's sometimes you have to, sometimes there is no way to say it nicely, but the method methodology to get their competition and say, look, they're doing better. I mean, I don't know what it's like in the U S but here in Europe, insurance companies, I can't believe it. One of my friends is, is terminally ill. He is looking to change his insurance company and draw up his last will and all of that stuff. And he has a lot of money and he cannot navigate their websites. So there's already been six, insurance companies that missed out on a very lucrative customer simply because you can't navigate their website by keyboard. Yeah. Um, Tanika asked when working on web accessibility, how do you define and measure success as you complete each project? Ah, that's a nice one. I think that's one to chop up. Um, when is the project at an end? Is that when you do the user testing? Is that when your tests go through where they're automated testing that it only covers like 30%? Still a lot, but only 30%. When is the end of a project? How successful was it? Do you get to work with the SEO guys, do you get to work with the, or the girls or, or with the team? Do they share with you, hey, we have higher conversion on this or this article is converting better because we have descriptive links or um, we suddenly see a raise in this or that. When do you start measuring that? Mm -hmm. The fact that it is accessible is a success in itself. 
Yeah. So, I mean, we, we measure, we always tell people, I mean, first of all, we're not lawyers. So we never tell people that something is legally compliant, but we measure against WCAG, um, Web mm-hmm. Content Accessibility Guidelines, because I'm like, this is something we can measure against that is written out. Um, but yeah, I think you really have to define what it is. I mean, I think we tend, we consider success to be no obvious WCAG failures. Um, on anything that we have built or assembled. Now mm-hmm. there's content that gets imported in. <laughs> yeah. If we didn't look at it, I can't say anything about it, right? Yeah. And I think that's something you have to be careful about. Like, I don't know if you're ever guaranteeing the accessibility of an entire website, if it's a very large website that you've imported old things with tech. Absolutely not. But I mean, I think we like to think of success too, as um, for people who, came to us because they're interested, but they're, they're not really sold. Like knowing that, Hey, there we've created advocates. We've trained them so that they'll know how to maintain this moving forward Mm -hmm. uh, and what to look for as they're building out their content. Like, I think that's a big marker of success too. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Let's see. We have about eight more minutes. So I'm going to try and get through because we got a bunch all of a sudden. (laughs) Uh, so, so this is going to be your lightning round. Um, someone said, do you have any advice for having conversations with external organizations or clients versus people on your team specifically? If the accessibility moves you're encouraging are in conflict with their company culture or out of the job description of your contract there? Ah, we could do an entire meetup on that topic. Really, it is a very, very good uh, question. The advice to these external organizations or clients is you ask them, what is, what is your goal? What, what do you want to reach? Where do you want to be with your company in three or four years? Do you want to have more clients, more conversion, more of this or that? Um, And of course the answer is going to be yes. And then you can explain to them like, okay, but you can't bake the cake and eat it too. So this is what it is going to take. And then you take the possibility route. And this is why I call myself a possibility advocate, not just an accessibility advocate. Kill the bears on the road. Give them the possibilities. Um, and again, like like the suggestion of, of compare them to the competition who's doing better or worse, or I think that that would be... Um, be a good thing and you know if if something is out of the job description of your contact there i think that is up to you whether you want to pursue and go go higher up or talk to this person like do you think i should talk to someone in a higher zone in your company do you think it's important enough because then they don't risk their job and you just write them a message or contact them and and talk to them about this because no is the answer you already have Mm-hmm. You know, I think one thing too on that job description thing is one of the things we worked on doing was positioning ourselves as like ex- accessibility is something we really care about. And so even some of our older clients in the beginning, like we're maintaining stuff we built for them before we were super accessibility focused, but we kind of like worked on communicating that so they would know that when they come back to us, right? Or they're like, okay, you've been maintaining, just doing updates and now we want you to rebuild or add this new landing page that they wouldn't be surprised when we started like talking to them about accessibility, (laughs) right? But I think it's a little bit of a positioning. So if you, you know, you're a developer and just in the very beginning when you're bringing on a new client and having those contracts, you know, conversations or it's a job and you're applying for a job, like staying in the interview, you know, I really care about accessibility so that later on down the road, if you can be like, Hey, I know this isn't like part of what you want me to do, but I noticed this. So I'm just flagging it for you. Like they won't be surprised because you will have laid the foundation of like, I am someone who cares about accessibility. Yeah. Yeah. Um, let's see. Isaac asked, or said, creating accessible apps and sites are worth it. Can you share experiences on how agencies can convince clients to invest in accessibility for apps or sites? Because implementing accessibility translates into man hours paid in development. I know, again, another very big question in the last couple of minutes. It's, um, yeah, this thoughts. is a big question. And it also depends on if the, the customer asks you to repair something that can't be fixed. 
um, or if they want you to start from scratch. And I think um, there you you will have to take broader arguments. I mean, let's okay, let's do the scare tactics here. Not the US ones, but in Europe. In Europe, June 28, 2025 is D-Day. Do you know that? Web shops mm -hmm. have to be accessible. And then people say, ha ha, yeah, but not the small ones. Uh, yeah, the small ones too, when they decide to add a new product to their store from that day on. So, um, and then it's going to be a fear argument at first where you say, okay, you know, you have to be accessible. It's by law and people can actually find you. In Germany, this is happening with other stuff, but this is the scare tactics. And then take the scare tactic off the table just like that and say, listen, hey, if you do it now, if you do a relaunch of your app or of your site and you do what we call the shift left movement, so you you draw in an accessibility consultant right from the start before you even start writing your ideas on paper, you're going to know that the cost for developing something that is accessible is not that much higher. And in fact, if people would just learn to use semantic HTML and accessible code in a couple of years, it won't cost anything extra because it's just part of the job. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Liz wants colorful Dutch expressions for ugly visual ones. <laughs> just for fun. And I think that can be our, our, our last question. So are there any colorful Dutch expressions for ugly visual design? <laughs> No, I right now there's not a Dutch one that comes to my mind, but one of the funniest expressions to me ever was a dear customer I had from the US and she said, Oh, and have you seen that? Seen that? That is just so fugly. <laughs> fugly. <laughs> but fugly. yes, that is that is a word that people in the US say. <laughs> yeah. And that was new to me. So that was that was hilarious to me. Yeah. yeah. Well, thank you everyone who came um, and hung out with us until the very end. We very much appreciate it. Thank you again. And if anyone wants to reach out to you, um, what's the best place to follow up? Oh, if you want it to be quick, find me in a DM on Twitter. Just follow me on, on Twitter and mention me if you can't DM me because I'm not following you. I always forget how that works. Um, the way not to do it is to use LinkedIn. <laughs> I suck at LinkedIn. <laughs> yeah, so, if someone can contact me on LinkedIn, I'll probably see it in about five months. <laughs> exactly. Same here. So yeah, um, shoot me an email. Shoot me a LinkedIn. Um, my new site is going up uh, in a couple of weeks. And then you can also book an introductionary meeting with me uh, through Calendly that I actually tested with keyboard. And that works. And my friend Lazar said it works. So if anyone has anything to say about the accessibility of Calendly, do it. Oh, yeah. I have thoughts. I think one sub yeah. is better, but it, we don't have time. Uh, so if we did not get to your question, please join the Facebook group. Uh, that is the best way to follow up between meetups. I'll throw another link in the chat for that. Um, and we will see you back here soon. We're going to do a little um, wave and smile here at the end, just because I need to not end the meeting until our transcript is done in case anyone is relying on the transcript. So thank you so much, Anne, and thank you, everyone.